most powerful force to, that defines religion uh, is society. Um, it's very important to understand that religion is an ever malleable thing. It, it, there is no such thing as Christianity. It doesn't exist. There are Christianities and the way that one defines uh, the gospel, the way that one understands uh, Jesus as either the Son of God or the Messiah or as a, you know, a, a great teacher to, to, to emulate, um, the way that one uh, places sort of the, the Christology or even the creedal formula of, of Catholicism um, has everything to do with where one lives. Um, if you are a Catholic living in suburban uh, Denver uh, with your two and a half kids in your car in your house, your Jesus is probably a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, peacenik who turns the other cheek. If you're a Catholic living in the hills of Guatemala, your Jesus, besides being Mexican, is a fighter, a liberator, one who stands up to the oppressor and indeed who takes up arms against oppression. Uh, it's the same Jesus, it's the same Catholicism, but the understanding is radically different depending on where you live. The same, of course, is true of Islam. If you're a Muslim living in Detroit, uh, then your idea of Islam is as a, a, of a religion of peace and submission and, and pluralism. If you're a Muslim living in a garbage heap on Gaza, then your version of Islam is as a religion of social justice. Um, so everywhere that you go, you will see different expressions, different uh, manifestations of what can be called the same religion, the same faith. And I think that we need to understand that uh, because in a way, too often we look at the differences between religious communities as being defined as differences in religion. And frankly, it's more often differences of community than it is of religion. Religion is an ever-evolving process. If a religion stops evolving, it dies. And there are thousands and thousands of examples of dead religions in the world uh, that we can talk about um, that simply went away because they were not able to adapt to the constant changes of human civilization and human societies. The reason we talk about the great religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, these five massive world religions that have been around for thousands of years and, and that have billions of worldwide followers, what makes them great is because they are constantly adapting. They're constantly evolving. That's why they, they continue to exist. The moment you stop adapting, the moment you stop evolving to whatever social, political, economic, uh, or cultural landscape that the religion finds itself in, the mo that's the moment in which it goes away. But talking about Islam, particularly as it's experienced in uh, the Middle East, I think you can't talk about uh, the, the rise of the Islamic State or the rise of jihadism or any of the various political or economic or religious conflicts that are taking place in that region without first starting with colonialism. Uh, the colonialist experience, which you know came to an end only about half a century ago, we tend to forget that, um, was a, a, a profound experience for the world's Muslims. You're talking about an era in which 90% of the world's Muslim population lived under direct colonial control. It had an enormous influence on the development of the modern uh, Muslim consciousness um, and the way that it sort of allowed Muslims to define themselves as opposed to an other. In this case, a uh, rabidly westernizing and aggressively uh, uh, Christianizing uh, and, and total dominating force, a force that dominated the social, economic, political, and religious landscape of the Middle East, uh, had, I think, an enormous influence on the way that Muslims began to see themselves vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And with the end of the colonialist experience, with the decolonization period that began uh, around the Second World War, 
um, and accelerated immediately after that. Um, and this geopolitical fragmentation that was left behind in which Muslim populations who had hitherto thought of themselves as uh, members of a worldwide community of faith were now suddenly forced to think of themselves as citizens of nation states, nation states that in most cases were created through arbitrary borders and totally fabricated nationalities with the sole purpose of making these uh, parcels of land more easily uh, divisible and, and passed and pass along amongst the, the colonialists, whether they be French or Dutch or English or, or Portuguese or Spanish. Um, the idea that now you had to sort of define yourself in this, in this incredibly unfamiliar way, um, I think really rattled uh, a lot of Muslim civilizations. Um, some of them were able to do so uh, without much uh, uh, trouble, uh, but many Muslim states, uh, particularly in the Arab world, I think really are to this day having a very difficult time trying to define what exactly it even means to be a Muslim state. Does it mean that you have to have Muslim governance? Does it mean that you have to be ruled by Islamic law? Does it just simply mean that you're a majority Muslim state? Uh, what, what is it, how does one define oneself? And I think that particularly in the language that we use when we talk about the countries in that region as Muslim states, it doesn't help because frankly, I can't imagine what Morocco has in common with Saudi Arabia or what Saudi Arabia has in common with Turkey or what Turkey has in common with Indonesia absolutely nothing, not language, not culture, not ethnicity, not customs, not religion, and yet we refer to all of them as Islamic states. Uh, so I think it's not just Muslims themselves that are having a hard time defining uh, post-colonial um, Middle East uh, and, and what that means. I think the rest of the world is having just as a difficult time as figuring it out.